I'm Amy Lettingham. I'm a master certified dating and relationship coach. And I'm Kevin Lettingham, Amy's husband and a former reality and docuseries TV producer director. And together we want to welcome you to Sex, Love, and Mindful Dating. It is wedding day. That means episode 10 of Love is Blind. The five couples we've been tracking all these weeks are ready to walk down the aisle and say I do, or they might say I don't which will let us know if they think their partner is actually marriage material or not. And as a dating and relationship coach, my goal for anyone I work with is to help them gain clarity on what they really need to know before making a lifelong commitment. Today, I'm going to discuss some of the most important parts of my conscious dating program to help you understand what to look out for when it comes to finding your forever relationship. And if your goal is to find lasting love, my conscious dating programs help you do just that, We do it through breaking your unhealthy dating beliefs, attitudes, patterns, and through my online dating courses, group coaching, and personal one-on-one virtual coaching, I can help you. Contact me at amythedatingcoach.com, that's A-M-I-E, thedatingcoach.com, and mention the podcast to receive a special offer. Episode 10 was awesome. We finally got to see everybody walk down the aisle and be asked if they do or don't want to marry the person. Uh, And that brings us to the question is, what makes someone marriage material? So Amy, maybe you could kind of start us off in what you think makes someone worth marrying. Yeah, when it comes to marriage, there are five main principles that I think your partner should have that align with you to make them marriage material. Number one is life vision and purpose. You need to know that you both have the same viewpoint of how you guys want to live your life. And these things need to be discussed early on before you even get married. Number two is your non-negotiables. This is the core values you must have aligned with your partner in order for the relationship to work. Number three, your partner's actions and words must match. Number four is vulnerability. It's where your partner is willing to show up and be seen as their true authentic self, flaws and all. Number five is communication. It's about how you talk, how you fight, and how you resolve problems. All right, well, that's a great list. Uh, I love those five things. And I think maybe the best way for us to kind of talk about these is to bring in our own experiences. Uh, Of course, Amy and I are married. We've been married eight years now, uh, together almost 10. And all five of these will discuss some of our initial thoughts when we were dating. So life vision and purpose, which I thought is something that you and I initially had. I was 40 when basically when we met, you were seven years younger, but we were on the same page in terms of life vision and purpose. Yeah, well, we talked about the hard stuff first, you know, and I think when people start dating early on, they just talk about interests and hobbies. We were talking about marriage. We were talking about finances. We were talking about where we want to live, like in the future. And we were talking about our careers. Like one of the big things that, you know, I know most people get excited, but when I found out you worked in entertainment, I wasn't that excited because I knew you'd be gone a lot. For me, for life, purpose, and vision, I always said that if the person I'm with can't handle my career, and I was working, I was out of town sometimes six months a year. I was working anywhere from 12 to 14 hour days, sometimes six, sometimes seven days a week. It was a full-time job on steroids. And if the person couldn't, you know, handle it, they couldn't be in my life. Yeah. And one of the things that I did is I asked you early on, how would our relationship look like with your work? And, you know, as long as you made me and I was very clear, made me feel like you were still in the room, even though you weren't then our relationship would work. And you always did that. You sent me flowers, you wrote me cards, and we would connect with each other. I would, you know, send you dinners. Like we did things to make it feel like we were still connected, even though there was a distance. Yeah. All right, well, let's talk about non-negotiables. Those are the deal breakers or the core values you must have in a relationship. Uh, Those are super, super important. And I know early on, I was checking them off for you. In fact, at our wedding, I basically outlined 
a lot of my non-negotiables in the wedding vows to reinforce the fact that you had all the things I was looking for. Yeah, and I remembered <laughs> the things that were some of his non-negotiables were some of my flaws that I actually was embarrassed about, but he celebrated them. And that created so much like, oh my gosh, I'm marrying the right man. He loves that. It was part of his non-negotiables. <laughs> Yeah. And that I think is something that is super important. People, you know, we're going to see in, in this episode that non-negotiables might be the tentpole of all these. They're number two on this list, but they might be the most important element. Uh, number three is actions and words. Your actions and words always seem to match for me. Yeah. I think there was one point when we were dating early on um, that you would text me because I think you were trying to stay in touch but you would only text me throughout the day and then I wouldn't get a phone call. Yeah, uh, and I was working. I remember I was working. And it was hard for me to break away and talk. Yeah, and it was like 16-hour days you were doing. But then I had mentioned to you, I said, you know, I'm a phone person. And even a five-minute call, like maybe through your lunch break, would make me feel really happy rather than just texting because it feels so impersonal. And you actually follow through your actions and words match you started calling me yeah and, and it was important you laid it out and i'm like i get it you don't want to be in that text relationship some people like that that's okay but you didn't no and i'm more traditional so yeah. and that showed me that you met my needs so that was something that showed me character number four is vulnerability you know i've always been a very vulnerable person i'm the kind of person that says mostly what I want to say. Uh, and I expect the person I'm with to also be like that. I don't want to hide things and I don't want anyone to hide things from me. That's something I really valued about you, that you're so transparent, even when it hurt. <laughs> uh, because a lot of my exes were not vulnerable. They would tell me what I want to hear just to make me happy. And they would do all these things behind my back. Uh, the one thing that I really thought brought us in a deeper connection is when I got to be vulnerable, where my exes, where I was vulnerable, they would judge me. They would tell me I was stupid or dismiss. You actually listened and you understood and you didn't judge me. You actually made me feel very loved and you understood, you know, my pain. Yeah. And you did tell me a lot of things that were, that were pretty heavy and deep early in the dating process. And you know, that can backfire. Don't get me wrong. Just because you're spewing out all your issues in life is not vulnerability. And it also doesn't mean that the person is going to be receptive. So I think we've got to be careful to, to say, you know, it's not okay to just spew out everything at early on in dating. It's got to be a two way street and it's got to be at the right time and the right sentiment. And both of us did that. We were on the same page with how fast we were able to release some of our warts. Yes. Yeah. Uh, communication. I mean, I remember early on, we didn't have a lot of fights in the first year or two. We started those fights really when we were getting married. <laughs> I, I remember the big fights were all around wedding day uh, or leading up to wedding day. That's when they should have had a camera on us and we would have been uh, part of Bridezilla's. I asked all my girlfriends, I'm like, do you fight this much? And they said, oh, everyone fights right before a wedding. <laughs> this is normal. <laughs> there's so much stress but we fought about the karaoke list <laughs> yeah that was a monster fight driving home from san diego oh yeah i mean, I mean that was yelling i think i even pulled over at some point and we were so angry <laughs> over over what songs were going to be sung in the karaoke list there's a great great fight right there um but communication was something that was super important always important to me um and you and i do fight but we resolve them yeah, even communication is so important because you have to be aware of your emotions. You have to deal with it right away. Don't let it stew because that creates resentment and anger. And, and then that's how you can get into a resolution. I'd like to take a moment to talk to you about my free ebook, Five Dating Traps to Avoid. It gives you tips to avoid all the traps that make your heart break. So go to amythedatingcoach.com and that's spelled A-M-I-E, thedatingcoach.com. All right, well, let's talk about some of the cast members. The first 
wedding that we saw was Gigi and Damien. That was a bleed over from episode nine where it was a cliffhanger and we didn't know what Damien was going to say. And shocker, he said no. She said yes. Did you see that coming? I did not see that coming. I kind of did. The moment that his parents didn't show up in the last episode. That's true. That's when I knew things were not working. And then they were having conflict leading up to it. And then she said she lost her butterflies. I mean, all these things added up in his head. Yeah, but the last four days, he said, have been great. That's why I thought he might still go through with it so he could be Yeah, but you, that's four days with the whole entire show. They've been having conflict the whole entire time. So that doesn't make up for the rest of the, the, the time that they've been together. Well, we did get to learn in episode 11, they're actually still together. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They're not married, but they're together. I think they like each other. I think they are good for each other. There's some growing up to be done on Gigi's side and his side, yeah. you know, but they are good for each other. Well, let's talk about marriage material. I mean, is Gigi marriage material? Well, based on one of the five principles, I, w I will say what's missing is their, the non-negotiable part for uh, Damien. You know, Damien wants somebody that can handle conflict resolution and communication. That's like the other thing, right? She's not good at that. She's too reactionary. It's like this up and down because she doesn't know how to handle her emotions. She's immature. Yeah. She needs to be a little bit more balanced. And, you know, I think communication is missing. And then that is a non-negotiable in itself. Yeah. I, I would argue that I'm not sure their life vision and life purpose is together. He seems like a kind of a, a regular working guy and she's a social media diva like i'm maybe that can work but you know i'm not sure if they're going the same places well the one thing like in my program um i have clients do personality traits exercises and you know people go well do opposites attract or like attracts alike i think in their life vision she actually brings him out of his shell a little bit and he actually brings her down to calm a little bit. So I think they actually help each other in that area. Um, that's where opposites do attract, where, you know, maybe some areas that you are flawed and you get somebody that can balance you out. Well, clearly the fact that they're together tells you that there's been some compromise. Yeah, yeah. And, I, and it sounds like in the other episode, they said, Gigi said, my parents love you. Yeah, and she does need an adult yeah. in her life. She cannot be dating some 25-year-old bouncer. Uh, somebody with the same personality, no. highs and lows, no, no way. No. Drama, drama, drama. Yeah, I'm still not convinced they'll be together. I, I think that she needs more time to mature before she can be with someone. But, you know, they're, they're good for each other right now. That's what we can say. Yep. Barnett and Amber. All right, obviously, there was a totally fake thing where Amber was wondering where Barnett was and he wasn't answering his phone. I'm like, oh, come on. Please. Is that produced? Oh, 100%. <laughs> and even when he did the I do's, he like paused and he joked. And he's a jokester, but that was, that was all planned. He was marrying her from the get-go. Yeah, I think he already sealed the deal. <laughs> and he knew if he didn't marry her, she'd kill him. Well, and I'm not joking. That's the part I will say, will they last forever? Well, I don't think their life vision necessarily is the same. Like she said some things that were like, I'm independent. I can take care of myself. Like she said that stuff in the pod. And then immediately when she met Barnett, she's like, I want to be a stay at home mom. And she isn't, she's starting to realize that like, Barnett's pretty selfish. And I think they also don't meet each other's non-negotiables 100% because Barnett wants someone who gets along with his family and fits right in. And, and Amber does not fit into his family. It's interesting. On the surface, she looks like she fits in. But when you get to the core values and how she's portraying herself and how she's speaking of their relationship and herself... They're definitely on two different pages. You know, hearing her in one of the episodes calling herself crazy in front of them, yeah. it doesn't bode well. No. And I, and I think in the episode 11, we'll jump into that, they already talked about getting divorced in the first year. So we know they're in for a rocky road. I think Barnett is still learning about himself. I'm not sure he's there yet. 
she needs major therapy before she can be in a serious relationship, I think. I agree. I think there's a lot of baggage underneath there that needs to be worked on. All right, well, let's talk about Kelly and Kenny. No surprise here. Uh, They did not get married. Uh, Kelly said no. Here's the part that was odd. He knew she was not going to say yes. I wonder if they made him do that. Because, like, you could see it in his face. He, she was already made her choice. I know. Or maybe they both made an agreement that he would take the, you know, to save face for her. I don't know. Because they want drama. They need one person to say yes and one to say no. Correct. So one of you has to say yes. So the producers have to set that up. Yeah. And, and I was surprised because, I'll be honest, I thought he should have just never walked up there. I mean, he knew it was happening, but he's probably under a contract. He had no choice. Yeah. Another thing we found out in this episode was that Kelly is still infatuated with her ex. I know. Which you can't be marriage material if you're still involved emotionally with your ex. Uh, I just think she is basing love on superficial things. She doesn't really, she has a hard time being vulnerable. So she doesn't really know herself and know what is right for her. So she's basing it on what a lot of singles do is what's good on paper. And what's good on paper for her is like really buff body, good looks. And that makes her excited. (laughs) Which is fascinating because Kenny's a good looking guy. Super nice. I mean, the one knock on him, maybe he's not super fun. Maybe he doesn't like that spark. She's not fun, though. I know that's the part that's fascinating. Like, she's not getting the flashy guys. They're not going to be into her. She's got something. When she looks into a mirror, she sees something different. Yeah. I think uh, when it came to all the five principles, I don't think that um, they had any that really aligned. They didn't say, I do, which is great. Yep. They didn't get married and get divorced. All right, let's move on to Jessica and Mark. I mean, look, they have none of the five. None of the five. Uh, I'm just glad that somehow, some way, Jessica didn't change her mind at the end and marry a guy wrong for her. But she was so happy at that wedding. It was almost ironic that she was like happy on her wedding day to say no. Yeah, <laughs> she she got up and hugged him and like kissed him. They're like, wait, 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 wait. you have to... We have to ask you the question. So she already knew she was saying no, and they already had a conversation. He knew. He knew. In terms of marriage material, Jessica or Mark, what do you think? Definitely not for each other. I mean, their life vision and purpose is not the same. Um, They maybe have two non-negotiables that are meant, which is like having children and being Christian. Yeah. That's it. That's it. But- When I work with clients, they usually have 10 to 15 of them. So if you only have two met, that's a lot others that are lost, right? There's a lot more that's on the table that needs to be met. Well, what about in general? Like, do you think Jessica is ready to be married? No, I think Jessica has to do a lot of internal work on herself. And I think uh, in the reunion show, she saw how much she drank and she didn't even realize like, the level she she how she portrayed herself and she was really shameful about it so i think the show really did a number on her mental state too so she's gonna have to do some a lot of work because of the show and also a lot of work so that she can love herself she does seem like she's on a path to improve her life herself yeah and hopefully she does i mean it's gonna take work because it's hard to do things alone when you're not clear about what the problem is Yeah. And Mark, I mean, he is 24. His immaturity shows. I mean, he did handle all the rejection and all that stuff very well. But did he? I don't know. I don't know. I think he he literally did not allow himself to absorb what was happening in front of him. And I think he was so driven to win and win her and look good on the show that he just turned it all off. Yeah. I, I think... Out in the real world, I think he's going to do the exact same thing again. I think he's going to fall in love immediately with somebody. Although he wasn't he wasn't dating in the reunion show, but... Yeah, I think Mark is in love with being in love. I agree. That's the only way I can explain him. He's not conscious or aware of why he does the things he does. He just knows that he wants to love. 
And if he likes you, he's going to love hard. And I think the interesting thing about Mark is he really needs to work on himself and work on his dating skills. And I wish he took his personal training acumen, the stuff he does in that, and hired someone like you. Yeah. (laughs) A personal trainer for love to teach him how to date. Yeah, he does need a lot of help in the love area. I mean, he's kind of just winging it right now and throwing darts on the board and hopefully <laughs> landing the bullseye, but it's not working. I do, nothing tells me he's going to do the work. And you need to do the work. If you're someone like him, to be marriage material, he's got to do the work. Yeah, well, most people don't realize they have to do the work until they get into a lot of tragic relationships and they start seeing a pattern. Then they're like, oh. And I did this. This is my story. You know, my last boyfriend recognizing, oh my gosh, how did I let this happen for this long? There's something wrong with me. I need to work on me. Uh, That's usually when we start reaching out or willing to be open to get help. Now let's talk about Cameron and Lauren, our favorite couple. And they did say I do to each other, no surprise. Yes. <laughs> and you cried. I did. I liked them as a couple. I did not cry. <laughs> so they got me in the first two episodes and then never again. I know. But, you know, the one thing about them, it's just like, they just know themselves very well. I feel like when I saw the vision board in Lauren's room, uh, and that was in like a episode eight or something. Yeah, I she'd been working on herself. And Cameron is just a very analytical person. So he just knows himself. He probably self-evaluates all day long. So when they both met, it felt like two people that were already whole in their own identity, combining and adding value to each other's lives. And that's when you should say yes. Yeah, and they did. Yeah, they definitely check the five. They check the life vision and purpose, non-negotiables, the actions and words match. They were both very vulnerable from the get-go and their communication style is very similar. And even when things were talked about that were uncomfortable, they were able to bring it up and hash it out and not just hold back. Yeah, they they have a a very adult relationship. And I think it's going to be interesting to see over the years, how they mature, because you and I have looked them up. They're already doing social media together, right? Yep. They are they have a life together that the world can see. They have a dog together. They have a dog. <laughs> Since they said I do has been a year and a half, but they're still together. And, you know, Amber and Barnett are still together. So of all five couples, two of them did say I do. And three of them did not. But more importantly, only one do we feel are both partners marriage material. Yeah. And you can see it clearly. Yeah. And and I think that in when you get into season two, which is going to be very interesting, they've already, you know, greenlit a season two, but with the pandemic, I mean, how, who knows how long that will take. It might be another year or two before they even get to shoot it. They might just keep him in pods. <laughs> <laughs> That's so funny. Yeah. You never you get married in the pod too. Yeah. <laughs> you just have a virtual screen, then you can see your partner. <laughs> That's funny. Yeah. All the dating is done with Zoom. Yep. <laughs> yeah. You go to you go to Mexico and all they do is green screen behind you. Yeah. <laughs> yes. We joke, but you never it, know. You never know. Someone might watch that, you know. No, I, I think what is really good about this show is it was authentic and you did get a a sense of whether these people were marriage material or not. I thought there was enough there and enough truth. Sometimes when you watch The Bachelor and those other shows, you never know who you're getting because you're not going home with them all that much. You're everything's like hyper romantic and it it didn't get real all that often. I liked the show because it was an experiment. I like the analytical part of it where the producers didn't manipulate anything in the pods. And they did a good job of picking good contestants. I think it was a successful experiment. Before we head off, let's uh, let's talk about some of the takeaways from episode 10. Takeaway number one, make sure your partner has the same life vision and purpose as you do. Because life is easier when you both are on the same path. 
Takeaway number two, know your non-negotiables, know your deal breakers. You have to make sure your partner meets all of them. These are core values you must have aligned in order for the relationship to work. Takeaway number three, actions must match words. This shows the character of a person and what you're looking for is consistency. That's when you know you can trust them. Takeaway number four, your partner must be vulnerable. They must be willing to show up with flaws and all and be transparent about who they are and what they want. This will help your relationship be stronger because you don't have to read between the lines. Takeaway number five, your partner and you must have good communication skills. It's how you talk, how you fight, and how you resolve a problem that keeps a relationship going. All right, well, that is the end of episode 10. Quite a, quite a ride. We got through all of those shows, which is pretty amazing. Yes, woohoo! Uh, now, I think we should clarify here, in all these episodes, we did focus on Love is Blind. We just want to point out that we won't be going on to a new TV show for episode 11. Uh, Amy, why don't you point out what we're going to be talking about? Yeah, with the theme of sex, love, and mindful dating, you and I are going to share our personal stories of when we were single all the way to dating, all the way to you know, our marriage today, and what we've learned and provide you tools and skills so that you can have a successful dating life. And if you're struggling with finding lasting love or you're dating the same toxic person with a different face, I believe I can help. Go to amythedatingcoach.com and schedule a free relationship readiness review with me. And remember, as always, if you did like the show, please give us a five-star review and hit the subscribe button. It really does help. Thank you again for listening, and we can't wait to share season two with you. Bye-bye.